thank you very much and uh, welcome to uh, from me to this meeting on marxism and autism i'm going to talk you through a um a powerpoint presentation which i'm going to share now as kathy said i'll be rattling through a bit so um anything you want to raise disagree with question etc then please do okay so marxism and autism there is a spectrum haunting europe sorry that's a bit of a marxist in joke but there you go um what we want to what i want us to discuss this evening what we're going to be looking at is can marxism help us to understand autistic experience so it's important there that we're saying autistic experience rather than what autism is i'm not making any claim that, that that marxism has special insight into neurology um or the brain this is not a talk about the the the, the medics of um autism but about autism as being autistic as a social experience so can marxism help us understand that experience and how so we need to start off by um defining the two main terms we're using in the title here marxism so there's mr marx there marxism is scientific socialism so by that um that socialism already existed as an idea before marx came along but it was basically a kind of idea of what a better world might look like rather than a scientific understanding of how society changes and how we might contribute to changing society marxism provided a cr critique of capitalism which we'll look at in a minute and it sees the future uh, the future that it's striving towards as an act of self emancipation by the working class a class which marxism considers to have what it calls radical change which means that the working class is a class that can not only liberate the working class not only liberate working people but can also uh, tackle cut the roots of other forms of oppression in society such as sexism racism etc and marxism is an approach that sees that history changes society changes through the process of class struggle and aims to abolish the division of society into classes autism okay so auto the, the approach that i will take here is that autism is an atypical neurology you're not going to hear me calling it a disorder or a flaw or a fault or anything like that it's an atypical neurology neurology meaning brain wiring or structure and it's an atypical neurology that leads to atypical cognitive functioning and processing that's the way your brain's working atypical communication atypical social interaction and atypical sensory sensitivities so i mentioned that marxism provides a critique of capitalism so let's start by looking at capitalism and how that might relate to autistic experience I think most people know that, that Marxism is anti-capitalist but it's that's not kind of the whole story really because in a way Marxism was pro-capitalist in the sense that it did it, Marx did recognize the progress that capitalism brought compared to the societies it it replaced and I would argue that for autistic people capitalism brings both development and distress it's both developed and distressing so it developed the productive resources um so it is under capitalism that the word autism was even co coined that autism was recognized that we've begun to un understand scientifically more about autism and been able to provide uh, more support services for autistic people because of that that development however those productive resources are privately owned um which means they're run in a way that is profit driven which is undemocratic and which it contains within itself a real strong drive towards social conformity and that and I'll explain this in the next few uh, slides how I see this that disables autistic people um and those of you familiar with the social model of disability will recognize that kind of way of thinking there um that what I'm arguing here is that it's not autism itself that disables autistic people but that autistic people are disabled we disabled by the society that we live in okay so for marxism the issue of the exploitation of labor is central to our understanding of the way any given society works and in employment autistic people are seriously disadvantaged there are a few um slightly out of date statistics there but i'll tell you they give you some idea of the really significant disadvantage that autistic working age people are in the labor movement in the uk you get cases quite common cases actually of hyper exploitation that one that one um there is of uh 
a hotel in Plymouth which, which paid a young autistic man less than half the minimum wage because they thought they could get away with it. In the end, they didn't get away with it, um, but they thought they could for ages. I think one of the main issues about work for autistic people is workplace rigidity. So um, capitalism arrived in the world in the form of factories. Um, but today, even things that aren't factories work like factories, um, call centres, public services, etc. People are expected to work at the same pace in exactly the same way. There's a real rigid sameness in the production process and there's a sensory environment, noise, lights, that kind of stuff around you that is assumed to be the same for everybody. So if everybody isn't the same, then it, that becomes a real problem for people who are atypical. And increasingly, this uh, focus on soft skills, or as I like to say, soft skills are hard. Um, the idea of, you know, customer service with a smile, do you want fries with that, um, etc. Uh, rather than a concentration on technical skills, which um, may come, actually come a lot easier to autistic people than the soft skills. Okay, so I think we need to look at class and autistic experience just to register um, that if you're an autistic person, then the effect of poverty um, for working class autistic people and lack of access to support is really important. And autistic people from wealthier families can often cope better with the, the difficulties that society presents because they have the resources to do so. When austerity leads to cuts in services, then it's working class autistic people and their families um, who lose out and who really struggle. And the austerity cuts um, not only lead to lots of practical support, but to social distress and insecurity and increased isolation. And often charities may, you know, step in and say, well, we provide this and we provide that. But what comes with charitable support also is the pity narrative of charity. Um, the idea that we are a deserving cause um, that people need to put money in, in boxes for, which, you know, even as it gives us extra support, it also takes away from us um, esteem and respect. So one area I want to look at is commodification and quackery. Uh, so research into autism tends to, as, as I see it, is, is driven by two things, panic and profit. So panic about, oh, my God, there's all these autism autistic people we have to find out what's causing it so we can stop it happening um and also oh there's people who want cures and treatments i can make some money by producing and marketing those which means the priorities about what's researched why and how um is, is is skewed away from our actual interests also you have an autism industry if, if any of you have been ever been to the annual autism show um I think you'll probably end up agreeing with me that it really needs to be renamed the Autism Trade Fair um, because it's just an event of people trying to sell you stuff, you know, some useful, some less so, some harmful in my view. And talking of harmful, um, quack treatments, that's uh, a way people can make a fast buck under capitalism. That particular one pictured, MMS, Miracle Mineral Solution, it's bleach, it's bleach. And there are people who will sell that to you saying, um, make your child drink this or indeed give them an enema of this and it will cure their autism. Um, it's, it's disgraceful and there are other products like that around. I think we also see the commodification of autistic talents. There's a, a real stereotype about autistic people all having some party trick and you're letting the side down if you don't have one. Um, but there's, you know, under capitalism, there's always going to be someone who wants to make a buck out of that as well. The next topic I want to look at is sense and sociability. So capitalism, I think, is a very sensory overloading society. Most of our cities now, most modern cities now, are an assault on your senses, um, whether it's noise, from noise or smell, from traffic, lights from uh, adverts the whole time, etc. If, if you have any kind of sensory sensitivity, it's becoming an increasingly pressurised and unpleasant place to live. Capitalism is also a system which, which is interesting, actually, because it claims that compared to nasty communism, um, capitalism is the system under which people can be very individual. Um, but if you go and look at all the com commuters pouring out of tube stations in the city every morning, um, you'll notice that they're not actually very different from each other at all. There is a real drive towards social conformity um, under capitalism and a social premium where you are judged, you are... Um, you know, you, you have to be successful and successful success is, is measured in quite narrow 
um, social ways. Okay, so autistic people and the state. This is quite an important experience of the uh, aspect of negative experience for autistic people currently. This chap is called Michael Gilchrist. He was tasered eight times by Manchester police um, and that has left him uh, a, a, a changed person. He no longer speaks because of the abuse he faced there. This fella is called Farouk Ali. Um, he's from uh, Luton and the police pinned him down and beat him up um, when he was helping the, the bin workers empty the bins outside his house. And then they, they chased him down the road in their car and they said, admitted they did it just for fun, just for a long. Okay. And this is Osim Brown. Osim Brown is 21 years old. He's in prison for a crime he didn't commit just because he happened to be there at the time and was convicted on joint enterprise um, and, uh, and faces being deported to Jamaica, a country he left at the age of four when his sentence finishes. They are all autistic. And they all had very bad experiences at the hands of the British state. If you look very carefully, you might spot something else they all have in common as well. Yes, they are all black men. And there really is a, a, a serious intersection between um, on the issue of police brutality uh, between um, black population and um, autistic people. And so Marxism can help us understand the nature of the state because we're mostly brought up to think that the state is some kind of neutral arbiter um, over society, making sure that everything's done correctly. But in reality, it's not. And as that chap there, Lenin, said, uh, he pointed out that the police, along with the army, are the chief instruments of state power. And that so long as the state exists, there is no freedom. When there is freedom, there will be no state. Okay, so that leads me to my favourite slogan. Um, we need revolutionary change. We need radical change to, to achieve the liberation of autistic people. We need to, as I like to say, smash the neurocracy. Okay, so what can socialism offer to autistic people then? So, first of all, we have to decide, define socialism. And what it is basically is a classless society. Society no longer divided into classes because the productive wealth is owned in common and run democratically. And that enables the planned production for need and not for profit. And if we democratic planned production, we can ensure, for example, Universal design, which means the built environment designed to be accessible to everybody, not just step free, but accessible on grounds of all kinds of um, issues. We can make sure that support services are provided. We can make sure there's a pluralism in communication so people can communicate with the society around them in ways that, that suits their brain wiring. And we can ensure that research is driven democratically, that the interests, the needs of autistic people and others are what determines what is uh, research, not just the, the search for the crock of gold at the, uh, the end of the, of the research rainbow. Under socialism, we can organise work in an autistic friendly way, because what we want to do is change work, not change workers. We can make sure that the sensory environment, the hours of work, the hours of work are much shorter, the sensory environment is much more benign, the pace and methods of work suit the way uh, people want to work, are less distressing and more accept accessible. Because what we're aiming to do, thinking back to what I said at the beginning about capitalism being both developed and distressing, is we can combine the advantages of mass production, the advantages of advanced and developed um, means of production, with this more of a scope for diversity and individuality than we see under the current system. Because socialism is. Um, a cooperative rather than a competitive economy. We can ensure there's a reduction in, in sensory overload, a clean, uh, including, for example, a clean and sustainable environment. And the one thing that I get really fixated on is getting rid of all those horrible, bright, intrusive uh, adverts that are everywhere you look these days. Okay, because essentially socialism is a, um, a system based on uh, what Karl Marx said, from each that produces things from each according to their ability and to each according to their need. Okay. Problem we're facing, essential problem, big barrier in our way is that capitalism is not going to concede this. Okay. So it may adapt to autistic people's demands in ways that don't cost it much or don't cost it anything. But radical, serious change is not going to be given willingly. Um, Capitalism won't willingly make radical changes that will cost capitalists money or power. 
So what we need to look at is, if you like, the political economy of autism, which is about looking for political and economic changes and demands that can really uh, make a difference to autistic people's lives, which gives me the excuse to plug um, the Labour Party Autism and Neurodiversity Manifesto that myself and lots of other people have been involved in drafting and which has uh, radical yet practical demands on uh, a lot of those issues listed there. I think it's worth us exploring in more depth the idea of whether Trotsky's ideas about transitional demands um, are useful in building a bridge between the immediate changes we want to achieve now and the vision of a, a different way of organising society to properly fulfil those aspirations. And we also need, as a labour movement, to make sure that whenever we're campaigning on any policy, we make sure the demands we raise are relevant to the working class in its, its full diversity. They don't assume uh, ne neurotypicality or any other kind of um, social conformity. So, near, nearing the end now, winning autistic liberation. What do I think we need to do? I think we need to carry on these discussions. We need to discuss and develop theory about oppression and liberation. We need to avoid, I think, being co-opted into mainstream autism awareness and the employer's agenda of, oh, we've got this online autism awareness course you can do, tick box, and carry on treating autistic workers uh, very, very badly. Um, we need our trade unions to fight more um, in, um, in the interests of their autistic members and become more accessible to their autistic members. We need to educate and mobilise our movement. And part of that involves making sure our, the, our movement itself is autism friendly, okay? So it needs to make things, communications and materials in different formats. It needs to be socially inclusive. Now that, that um, thing that has just come up on, uh, on your screen is a meme that was uh, posted on social media by someone who thinks they're a socialist. Okay, so it's got the working class saying, why can't you just be normal? And the left doing autistic screeching. Right now, if so, it's obvious why that's I, I hope it's obvious to everyone here why that is badly bigoted against autistic people. However, it, it, it's more than that. It's this idea that uh, the left, that there's a real danger in the idea that the left has to appeal to normal people. OK, yes, we have to we have to be relevant to working class people in all their diversity. That's not the same as saying we need to we need to be relevant to normal people because normal is a word that is much more pejorative and which um, defines in a very narrow way what sort of person we want to relate to and excludes an awful lot of people, not just on the grounds of neurology, but of race, um, culture, all sorts of um, factors. Okay, we need, so we need to stop the harassment and bullying that unfortunately some autistic people face in our movement. And we need to think about the sensory environment our, of our events so that they are tolerable, habitable. For autistic, autistic people and that brings me to the end of my um uh of my talk so i'm looking forward to your questions and discussions thank you very much uh hello everybody um uh, just so that you know i'm sitting in in fife in scotland and it's a lovely evening um i don't know what the temperature is but that's just one of those nice things to tell people about um, uh, I've taken a, a I, I'm approaching the issues from a very different angle from Janine, which I hope is going to make sense to everybody as I go through the document I produced. And I hope I'm about to open that card. That, okay. I'd like us to just have a little think about that at the beginning, because this is from the Communist Manifesto. And it's what they were predicting was that the world we would live in would become more and more prone to everlasting uncertainty and agitation. And that's essentially because the nature of the marketplace is to create constant change. So even if some things are stable, there will always be that we don't know how much things are worth. We don't know the value of this. We don't know the value of that. We don't know what's going to happen if we do this. We don't know what's going to happen so and so on. So when you live in an environment which is like that, plus everybody has been um, basically frightened into 
um, frightened into individual preservation at, at the possible expense of solidarity with others, because partly because solidarity with others has been made in some ways so so much more difficult um, than it than it than it used to be um, uh, in the workplace. Even I mean, we all know that unions have been systematically undermined. Um, and, and also that, you know, pe people like academics, I'm not an, not an academic, by the way, I've never really been an academic. I was a distance education tutor for Birmingham University whilst I was being a care worker. Okay, so, you know, the main job I had in life was being a care worker. Um, that quite matters to me because I think on the whole that the academic, the academic part is a bit futile. Um, it's, uh, it's a way of creating elites. Yeah, the, the miners canary in the middle with the assistive communication. Um, it's not actually my image. Um, but I think it illustrates what's needed quite well, is you need some way of getting out of that toxic atmosphere and into communication somehow with, uh, with other people. Okay, so share screen. That one. Okay, so um, in many ways, autistic people, because we're stubborn, single minded, uh, have certain priorities which other people don't necessarily share, and I'll, I'll, I'll come to that in a bit. Um, can be quite annoying. And this is actually a very, very valuable role in the world. So that's, I'm going to claim that for autistic people and generally weird people and everybody who just, you know, sticks their neck out and goes, Oi, that won't do. This is, this is how, it, look, listen to this. This is, just think about it for a minute. And, and so on and so on. Okay, so um, this document is produced in a um, fairly scatty sort of way, um, more or less me thinking out loud. And <laughs> what is it to own production in the 21st century? What is it? What is money? Even. And what? what is production? <laughs> what is it that we... What is it that we're capable of owning? We can't get the solidarity in the workplace. And we can't, therefore, own industrial power in the same way. Um, so I got, this is a quote from Marx. Um, in the social production of their life, men enter into definite, obviously people enter into definite relations that are indispensable and independent of their will. Relations of production, which corresponds with definite stage of development. And I think Marx would have recognized that technology is going to make a big difference to what the available possibilities are. And I think you know, we are in a situation now where technology has given us the potential to own the production of knowledge and do something about about getting people to understand the context of what they're seeing around them during the crisis that's going on now in terms of the tremendous insecurity that people have been, the, 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 the farcical greed, the appalling assignment of rights over people's health and well-being to private enterprises which are devoted to, to profit has been, it's been very revelatory. So it's like all that, all that is solid melts into air. That's what's happened. But lots and lots of people have actually come to a moment where compelled to face with sober senses the real conditions of life. 
I think that, you know, we are actually at a stage where a lot of people are confronting that their values have been very, very um, skin deep and, and uh, market, market, market dominated. People have been given a strange opportunity to be, to just exist for a while and to notice that they're alive and to notice that where the money is going and the research is going to deal with this crisis has been very, very strongly in influenced by capitalist considerations of profit. And the medical professionals all over the world are not, perhaps not quite becoming socialists, but understanding why people would. So it's a very, very interesting situation. And I would love to have Marx around now to do an analysis of things like <sighs> the gap between the vested interests of the folk who are really getting richer and richer and the in, basically very threatened, very precarious existences that most people are facing now, but especially people perhaps who are not regarded with respect and are not prioritized when it comes to the provision of uh, a, a worthwhile life. So I'm not sure whether people listening now are aware of how many, you know, it's not just old people in care homes who died during this crisis. There are a tremendous number of uh, people with learning disabilities and other disabilities, uh, including autistic people who don't speak and really perfectly capable of enjoying life and who have just been, uh, in a way that I'm afraid provokes in me a suspicion that, no, I wouldn't quite call this as a conspiracy, because I don't think too many people needed to talk to too many other people or make agreements but a kind of a nod and a wink that you know, social care bills are very, very large. An awful lot of people are dependent on uh, this money. We could cut the social care bills wonderfully if they all drop dead. Sorry if that seems uh, over cynical, but um, I know I'm not alone in thinking that and, and that includes some of these doctors. Um, in fact, in Sweden, basically, you know, Sweden has stopped being a socialist country. And um, they said that anybody over 65 should be sent into an old people's home with palliative care and not treated for the illness. And that was their official policy. So that was saying, just, you know, if you're going to die, just go home and die. And that's, that's fine by us. We'll give, you, we'll give you morphine to make it all less awful. Okay. Um, let's, let's, let's try and get to some of the nice stuff. Um, which is about why we're good productive irritants. Somebody's done some research into... The moral preferences, when, when a bunch of autistic people were, were asked, and other people were asked what they regarded, to, to, they were asked to, to rate loyalty, authority, purity, care, and fairness, right? And typical people tended to prioritize loyalty, authority, and purity, and autistic people tended to prioritize care and fairness. Um, I think the reason for that is that you probably know that we're often accused of uh, lacking theory of mind or being unable to read minds, as though most people could, could read minds. I mean, it's just a nonsense idea. 
Um, and yet what they're really talking about is the fact that most people, most of the time, have yoked, I can't actually see all my picture here, that's a bit annoying, um, have yoked together their sense of reliability and their sense of how the world is, is supposed to be with position. So loyalty, authority and purity. Purity is about boundaries. Authority is about hierarchies and loyalty, again, is about boundaries and, and proving yourself that, you're, you, you will, that you care more about these people than you do about those other people, right? So that's just a fascinating thing that it seems to be a trend. And as I say, it's because we don't do the simultaneous negotiating our position with the people we're talking with, because we assume that our position is not basically relevant. Why would it be? Sometimes, of course, it is, and we can understand that perfectly well, but it's not constantly yoked with our thinking. And I think you know, that is the, the grain of truth in the lacking theory of mind idea. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go down. I really could do with a glass of water, so I'm going to give you some nice pictures to look at. Whoops. Oops. I will come back and do this. I'm sorry that's sideways, but I'm just going to get myself a glass of water. And that's a list of words taken from a book by a young naturalist, a young autistic naturalist, and they just describe stuff he feels. So those are the kind of, um, I, I believe the main difference between autistic people and not autistic people is that we give a larger share to our current interest. Whatever it is that we're into, we're giving more to it, right? And that's one of the reasons we don't have this other stuff yoked, because that actually uses a lot of processing resource all the time. And we don't like using processing resource outside what it is that we're currently preoccupied with. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but I think that is really the key. The key thing is that we find it particularly difficult. It's a bit as though we were always at a, a football final. We don't want interruptions. We just want to focus on this thing which is in front of us now and not have to worry about anything else. Not have to worry about supper or getting the next beer. Okay. Um, we're often accused of being abrupt, of interrupting, of disrupting. We're very, very rarely accused of corrupting, and people who are aware of etymology probably realise that corrupt means getting together to rupture the flow. So it's being, it's getting together with others, whereas disrupt, interrupt, and abrupt are just about the kind of... Um, things that other people don't like because they, they somehow get in the way of, of the flow. So they see them as, as breaking a flow that was a desirable flow previously. So that's how come we're, we're productive irritants is because we just are willing to, to do those things. We're willing to be abrupt and say that this flow is actually going in the wrong direction, guys. Come on. Um... So Jeanine touched on some of this stuff about being disapproved of and the stigma. So I just this is from that book. And basically, I, I wrote out a lot of words from the, from the book and cut them on pieces of paper and combined them. And I'm not sure whether there's another picture there. Yes. You can see, I hope you could. Can you see that all right? I'm too old for my body to be seen skipping. And then we don't have to control ourselves here which is out there when you're not away, not in society. And over there, it actually is supposed to say, wildlife is my refuge, never disappoints like people can. Um, so all that intoxicating, intoxicating, explosive aliveness can be absolutely trashed sometimes. 
Um, do I have here? It needs to be. It needs to be recognised as of goodwill and uh, incorporated into people's expectations of what kind of humans they're likely to meet in life. Basically, is some people who may get very very excited about some stuff. This this young naturalist here has a has two siblings who are more obviously autistic than he is, and they flap and and shout and things. And at least one of them very much does does that. And um, all of them are aware of uh, social stigma. And at, at their happiest, when they're able to form a society amongst themselves, where they're all going out and appreciating the same aspects of, of nature. So, um, so I want to go back to okay. So we've got this loyalty, authority, purity, position, care, fairness, which is about reliability. Okay, so. I want to just get back to this business of producing knowledge, of being involved in knowledge production, which we are, and making sure that it's, it has some kind of authority. How do we make sure that we've got some kind of recognized value to the information that we are attempting to put before people? It's a really, really difficult situation here for making that happen. The, you know, the academic standards were never, and were never really designed to produce interesting, interesting, insightful truths. They were designed more and more to tick the boxes which would get everybody promotions. So that is, isn't really available as a very useful resource, in, in my opinion. I think we've got to create some kind of a, a knowledge base that is recognised as having uh, as having some lasting value, as, as not being just invented. This sounds a little bit idealistic. Um, however, I, I just can't see how we can build solidarity if we don't have a foundation of shared, shared truthfulness. So finding some way of, of giving people, and, and people having confidence in that, people having faith in that, that we're all seeing the same, we're all recognizing features that are genuine in a shared world. Um, I think it's really difficult. So, and I'm very worried about the way that the bureaucracy and the marketplace have just intersected and that, that I'm just going to read this out. Corporate ownership of the apparatus of the state and the educational institutions, essentially, um, separately. Private police, private armies, unequal application of laws, and he got it left out there. Unequal access to sources of health and well-being, excessive reverence for authority, perpetual surveillance, lack of personal autonomy for all but the elite. Universities are actually obliged to beg from plutocrats and their people by precarious workers owned by vested interests and covered governed by insecurity. So sorry, I'm sure you all know that, but it's a very worrying aspect to me of the this business of information, reliability, and sharing, and knowing where we're at. These are just a play on the words which have been colonized. There are so many words which have been, I keep thinking of more, but right now, you know, a business is just a bit, you know, it's just people being busy. Futures, futures is in the marketplace. Managing, you know about management. Shares, ha, huh. I don't mean, you know, what, are they, what is it about sharing? Same word, companies. We're company for each other. Hey, but they took that word too. It's just, just looking at how pervasive those kind of assumptions are. Um, so, and yeah, 
survival of comradeship, when we don't actually meet in the workplace, when we don't have opportunities for feeling the solidarity in that way, which is kind of strangely more connecting and makes you feel special. And instead, we've got an enormous number of roots towards expressing very, very similar ideas and, and, and which are only going to be seen by a limited number of people, which is really kind of depressing. Well, I must say Janine is pretty good at, at, at outreach. Um, basic, basically uh, much better than I am. Um, but, I mean, did you, I, I didn't realise how unreal money is now. Did everybody here just really, I mean, I, you know, I always knew it was somewhat unreal, but I listened to this YouTube link that I've got there, which lasts about less than 20 minutes, and it's just absolutely staggering how there's this kind of chain of complicated borrowing with profits being made at various places, and it doesn't appear ever to be really anchored to to anything except belief systems. So is that our way forward, to puncture the belief system or to provide a different belief system? What can we do about that? I don't know if we can do anything about it. <laughs>